as the Insider Exclusive Investigative News Team travels across America producing the Justice in America Network TV series, we invite you to join us as we uncover real stories about the issues that promote justice and fairness for injured people, safeguards victims' rights, and the opportunity to help guide the hands of justice, especially when people's lives have been destroyed, families ruined, dreams lost, or widespread societal change and reform are needed. These true stories about real, ordinary people, their real lives, always up close and personal, and always unfiltered stories of unimaginable pain, suffering, and great wrongs, but also of courage and faith and the dauntlessness of the human spirit. These stories are also about the trial lawyers who helped these ordinary people navigate a very complex legal system to get justice as they faced extreme life-altering adversities and how the government and big business with their million-dollar PR campaigns are slowly eroding our rights to seek justice and making an end run around the civil justice system. Our TV stories show relief and vindication for shattered lives and seemingly lost souls. The compassion, warmth, love, and determination of the human spirit found within these shows are neither imagined nor contrived. They are truly personal crusades and telling journeys of what it means to seek justice in the American courtroom. In this insider-exclusive network TV special, Justice in America, the truths and myths of tort reform, we visit with Trip Walton at the Walton Law Firm. As he takes us inside today's legal system, examining lawyers' strategies, clients' thoughts, and in vivid detail, showing you the often heartbreaking stories of these clients, dramatically demonstrating what motivates trial lawyers to fight for their clients' causes. Some of these same trial lawyers have been in the crosshairs of attacks by so-called tort reform advocates for the past 30 years. These attacks are not new. Now, a lot of you have heard and read about tort reform, but really don't understand how or what it really means, or how it affects us negatively every time we walk into the courtroom. So in this special Network TV Insider exclusive documentary, Justice in America, The Truths and Myths of Tort Reform, we will show you how tort reform is making justice more and more difficult for the average American. And we're not going to do it by words or fancy language, but by inviting you along to meet our guests and their lawyers in small towns and big cities filmed across America, who've had the unfortunate bad luck to be severely injured or victimized by big businesses, the government, or law enforcement. These victims could be you or me one day, and if you are so unlucky, you will quickly find out that justice in America is a hard-won battle where very few companies and individuals do the right thing. And you need trial warriors who wage a battle with their own financial resources to get their clients justice. But before we get started, just for the record, let's define what the heck tort reform means in simple language. Tort is a legal term describing the system of compensation used by the courts to assign remedies, awards, and damages for harm done by one party to another, be it to their person, property, or other protected interest. Tort law defines what constitutes a legal injury and establishes liability. It's the civil court's answer to criminal law. Tort reform, then, is the political term for the controversial issue of reducing tort litigation, awards, damages, and or compensation. Now, tort reform isn't one single idea or law. Instead, it's a group of ideas and laws designed to change the way our civil justice system works. While each tort reform law is different, they all share one or more of the following goals. To make it more difficult for injured people to file a lawsuit, to make it more difficult for injured people to obtain a jury trial, and to put limits on the amount of money injured people receive in a lawsuit. Keep in mind that throughout history, our civil justice system has kept Americans safe by allowing them a fair chance to receive justice when they are injured by the negligence of others, even when it means taking on the most powerful corporations. When corporations and their CEOs act irresponsibly by cutting corners on safety, producing unsafe products, polluting our environment, or swindling their employees and shareholders, the last resort to hold them accountable is in our courts. The legal system provides justice to those injured by deliberate misconduct and deters future misconduct by holding wrongdoers accountable. 
Here's just a quick review of a few Justice in America Network TV show segments of these real case stories of ordinary people, their real lives, and their trial lawyers who've helped these ordinary folks navigate a very complex legal system to get justice as they faced extreme life-altering adversities. Real cases that promote justice and fairness for injured people safeguards victims' rights and the opportunity to help guide the hands of justice. Especially when people's lives have been destroyed, families ruined, dreams lost, or widespread societal change and reform are needed. And how the government and big business are slowly eroding our rights to seek justice, making an end run around the civil justice system and calling it tort reform. For many of the nearly 50,000 9-11 first responders, the wounds of the Twin Tower attacks are far from healing. These rescue workers continue to struggle with respiratory illness, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder, and many of them may be at increased risk for developing a number of cancers. Because they and their fellow rescue workers were picking through rubble littered with asbestos, mercury, crushed fluorescent light bulbs, and other known toxins, and they were outfitted with only their normal uniform to protect them from potential contaminants. When hundreds of victims and their families were left struggling with impending health problems and emotional instabilities after the World Trade Center attacks, the Uniform Firefighters Association of Greater New York selected one law firm, Sullivan, Papain, Block, McGrath, and Canavo, their friends and trusted legal advisors for the past 20 years, to come to their rescue. Because sometimes, even first responders need to be saved. I was promised a better life, far away from my home. I used to have a family. Now, I must pay for my family's debts. I sleep with many men every day. They make me kill for a war. Work many long hours. Trapped. Beaten. Scared. Locked in the dark. With no way out. I want to go home. I want my freedom. 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 The last thing that we as Americans would, would remotely suspect is that the greatest engineering firm in the world, so named because they were able to build a Panama Canal when no one else could, the greatest engineering firm in the world caused, caused the flooding of this city. Not Hurricane Katrina, the United States Army Corps of Engineers.
and because of one negligent moment, it has become a painful and needless tragedy. The state of Louisiana's medical malpractice laws are full of traps and how the healthcare and insurance industries are far more protected than anywhere else. In Sharon Boxy's case, you will see how her doctors malpositioned her head and neck during surgery that substantially reduced blood flow through the carotid arteries to her brain causing massive brain damage which went undetected during surgery and rendered her a total quadriplegic. So far in 34 years, no one has come close to having a Supreme Court decision yeah. finding that the cap or the act was unconstitutional. Um, we are going to show right now uh, a day in the life of Sharon Boxy and what these doctors did to her. And you're quite familiar with this video that we have on the screen right now. Tell us a little bit about her daily activities. Well, her daily activities are markedly reduced. Her sister and her family have, have been incredibly supportive, uh, caring for her and doing the physical therapy and the other um, steps that are necessary to keep her alive and, and functioning as well as she possibly could. But basically, in the course of a day, uh, because of her limitations, she can do virtually nothing other than watch TV, talk with people yeah. who come over, uh, maybe read a little bit, but even read, I mean, she can't turn a page. She has no movement in her hands or arms or legs. Don mentioned to me, Sharon, that one of the reasons that you have so much drive and fortitude is you want to show others that the laws in the state of Louisiana aren't the best laws in the world concerning medical malpractice cases, right? That is correct. On July 26, 2003, at approximately 3.45 in the afternoon, Christopher Allison and his family were driving back to Pocatello, Idaho from their vacation in Washington. Suddenly and unexpectedly, their vehicle was struck by another driver from the rear, jackknifing their camper and overturning their Ford Expedition, crushing and killing Christopher and injuring the rest of the Allison family. Today, the Insider Exclusive will show you how the Allison's lawyers, Robert Krauss 
and Emily Rankin of the Spence Law Firm took on Ford Motor Company and successfully sued them for the defective product design of the door latch and component system and other defects and got justice for the Allison family. My name is Jeffrey Scott Hornoff and I'm a police officer. I was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Every step of the judicial system failed me and my family. And if not for the guilt and remorse of the true killer, I'd still be in prison. She died, I killed her. Why would you not want to ensure that California stops putting innocent people in prison? It's a very good question. I was locked up when I was 20 years old, just turned 20 years old. And I'm 42 now, so I've been in a little over 22 years. It was hard for my father to explain to me. I got convicted of raping somebody, but daddy didn't do it. So it was like, how you not do it, daddy? You've been in here for all these years now. Everything in life is wonderful, and then one day, somebody comes up and tells a lie on you, and you end up in jail. What's different is he knows fear doesn't exist. When they told me rape, robbery, Possession of instrument, a crime, a gun, a conspiracy, all these. I'm like, oh my God, you know, this, this is almost like 100 years in jail for something you didn't do, and I'm, I'm really scared. I was in shock because I got found guilty. I looked him right in the face and I said, You and I both know I didn't kill anyone. And he couldn't look me in the eye. He sentenced me to all that time, and I didn't know what to expect in prison. You know, I expected to uh, be beaten, be raped. I expected to die in prison. The government has failed the exonerated. It's finally over. It's been 19 years. What now? Go home. Dr. William J. Irwin failed to comply with the appropriate standard of care for an OBGYN in the year 2007. And as a result, Rebecca Gatti, a newborn baby, suffered severe brain damage, which is lifelong and irreversible. Those brutally frank words were how the Louisiana Medical Review Board explained to Ryan and Susan Gatti the parents of their new baby girl, Rebecca, why Rebecca had suffered irreversible brain damage due to the incompetence of Dr. Irwin and now will require round-the-clock care for the rest of her life with no chance whatsoever for improvement. Today, the Insider Exclusive will take you behind the headlines of this real-life couple, Ryan and Susan Gaddy, who entrusted their child's health and welfare to this grossly incompetent doctor. Following is a TV commercial for American Family Insurance. Since the dawn of time, people have needed people. The personal connection, 
the shoulder to lean on. That is our role. To deliver more than just a policy on a piece of paper. To deliver peace of mind. Because we are family. American family. And like family, we grow stronger each day with the constant promise to always be fair, helpful, and caring. Doing whatever we can to make things easier. Striving to keep our promises. This is what we do for our clients. We get to know them like family. Because that's who we are. American Family Insurance. But today, the Insider Exclusive presents a true, really tragic story, one that American Family Insurance doesn't want you to know. One hot Missouri summer day, Galen Ritchie's sister, Brenda, called her insurance company, American Family, and her agent, Catherine Philip Leitz, telling her that a 1,400 pound tree limb, nearly half the tree, had fallen on Brenda's house. She called three times that week, and on three separate occasions, American Family refused to pay to have this 1,400 pound limb removed. If you don't care about people, you couldn't do this job. Sounds real good, doesn't it? Only problem is, Anthem Blue Cross really doesn't mean what they say. Ask Bob Daringer, widow of Esther Daringer. 49-year-old Esther beat breast cancer until it metastasized to her brain. Ohio State University physician Dr. Herbert Newton, her physician, had successfully treated cancer like Esther's through intra-arterial chemotherapy. Her husband's health insurer, Anthem Blue Cross, paid for three of the 12 scheduled treatments. Bob and Esther first learned that the fourth treatment was being denied the day before it was given. The insurance company had approved the first three of the 12 treatments, but then refused further payment, declaring the procedure experimental. Cigarette smoking is the leading cause of preventable death in the United States. It causes serious illness among an estimated 8.6 million persons. It costs 167 billion in annual health-related losses, and it kills approximately 438,000 people each year. Worldwide, smoking kills nearly 5 million people annually. stand here today with dedicated colleagues from within the Department of Justice as well as beyond it to announce a historic settlement with Pfizer Incorporated 
In a combination civil and criminal settlement, Pfizer has agreed to pay $2.3 billion, the largest health care fraud settlement in the history of the Department of Justice. You now know that exposure to asbestos products caused this. Yes. Not only in the Navy, but also working as a custodian at the school. Yes. You're on national TV now. What do you have to say to the manufacturers that created these products? Well, they knew years ago, and they should have started much earlier in the, uh, in the process of eliminating the asbestos from all their products. Um, they chose not to, you know that. Mm -hmm. They chose not to. Uh, most of the major companies, uh, some that were, uh, that were litigated against, uh, filed bankruptcy and then turned around and regrouped and they were doing the exact same thing. They were going strong. Using the same, uh, same products. Yeah, they have a total disregard for human life, don't mm -hmm. they? They do. I like being a correction officer and I chose that field because I wanted to make a positive impact on um, inmates. I view my prognosis as good. I, I keep responding to treatment and I was just talking to my sister yesterday because there's times where you get down and you think, oh, you know, you just want to give up. Uh, cannot operate with one hand. Dr. Anthony Sterling is an orthopedic surgeon who can no longer take care of his patients. He's been disabled ever since 1998 when he had surgery to remove a bone spur pressing on his spinal cord. The surgery did not turn out well. The worst thing that could happen to a surgeon happened to Dr. Sterling. During the surgery, he suffered a terrible injury that rendered his left arm completely paralyzed, and it remains paralyzed to this day, trapped in an ugly brace. So the man who routinely performed about 500 surgeries a year and expected to continue helping patients for another 15 years can no longer enter an operating room. Across the U.S., people are rising up against fracking for natural gas. A deadly threat to our homes and our lives is looming on the horizon. It is a new technique of gas oil extraction. It is known by various names, for example. The oil and gas industry says it isn't new. The industry says it's safe. 
but the industry is lying. The vertical gas wells are a completely different technology. The new technique of deep horizontal fracking destroys drinking water supplies, pollutes our air and our environments, and will continue to do so for possibly hundreds of years as the well casings inevitably fail and disposal sites inevitably leak. In this insider-exclusive investigative TV series new documentary, Fracking, Dangerous Contamination, Bob and Lisa Parr's story, our news team found that in any area where fracking operations have happened, the local people have been outraged by the catastrophic damage to land, water supplies, air quality, animal and human health. Local economies have been destroyed, property values have fallen drastically up to 90%. And one of those areas is in Wise County, Texas, where the Barnett Shale is located. This is where we begin our story with Bob and Lisa Parr at their ranch and with their lawyer, Brad Gildy of the Gildy Law Firm. enough time, three seconds, for Clay Rush to possibly kick the game winner. Rush has made field goals of 20 and 26 yards, missed from 41. This one will be from 20 yards to win the Arena Bowl. When I think about football when I was playing, um, I like the challenges that it presented itself. You had to be physically fit. You had to be mentally fit. What's unique about arena football, I miss the fans. Um, it's a close-knit group. We consider us as a family. I've had over 30 procedures done with the head and neck. I've been on 90 different medications. I don't know what it's like not to have a headache. question you were here in July and you said that you were um, you commended Dodd-Frank for providing a blueprint mm -hmm. to get rid of too big to fail we've now understood this problem for nearly five years so when are we going to get rid of too big to fail well some of the you know as, as, you, as we've been discussing you know some of these rules take time to develop um, uh, the Orderly Liquidation Authority, I think we made a lot of progress on that. We've got the living wills. I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, if additional steps are needed, then Congress obviously can discuss those, but we do have a plan and I think it's moving in the right direction. Any idea about when we're going to arrive in the right direction? <laughs> it's, it's, gonna it's, a, it's not a zero-one kind of thing. It's, it's, a, it's over time. The concern that you have raised is one that I frankly share. And I'm not talking about HSBC now, because that, that, that maybe that not be appropriate. But I am concerned that the size of some of these institutions becomes so large that it does become difficult for us to, um, to prosecute them when we are hit with um, indications that if you do prosecute, if you do bring a criminal charge, uh, it will have a negative impact on the national economy, perhaps even the world economy. And I think that is a function of the fact that some of these institutions have become too large. Tell me a little bit about the last few times you've taken the biggest financial institutions on Wall Street all the way to a trial. Anybody? I appreciate that you say you don't have to bring them to trial. My question is, when did you bring them to trial? 
uh, we have not had to do it as a practical matter to achieve our supervisory goals. Can you identify when you last took the Wall Street banks to trial? Um, I will have to get back to you with the specific information. These are just a few of the real Americans who have dealt with our legal system that is gradually eroding in favor of big business and the government because of tort reform legislation. And this is why we all need to protect a legal system that is designed to protect us and not one that protects corporate business or the government or the common everyday American. Trip Walton has earned the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike as one of the best trial lawyers in Auburn, in Alabama, and in the United States. His goals, not only to get justice for his clients, but to make sure that everyone is treated with equal respect and dignity as guaranteed under the Constitution of the United States. He has seen many innocent and hardworking people become victims, and because of that, he is driven to fight for people who have been harmed by the willful or negligent actions of others. He has built a substantial reputation by consistently winning cases other law firms have turned down. His amazing courtroom skills and headline-grabbing success rate continue to provide his clients with the results they need and the results they deserve. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Auburn, Alabama. My great pleasure to introduce Trip Walton to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. I'm glad to be here too. I haven't seen you in a few years. It's been about three or four years. Yeah, you're looking good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Feeling good. Tell our audience a little bit about your firm. In other words, what kind of law do you practice mainly? My firm primarily handles personal injury and wrongful death cases caused by car crashes, tractor trailer crashes. And now we see tons of tractor trailer on tractor trailer crashes. Serious? It's too crowded. So we, we represent a lot of truck drivers against other truck drivers. Really? Tons of them. Wow. Just settled one two weeks ago. Really? Is that because the roads are too crowded? Roads are too crowded. Bad drivers? No, no, I don't know if they're bad drivers. They make mistakes. They take gambles. Okay. Some of them are bullies on the highway. Like they'll take out and expect you to miss them. Yeah. So we see that kind of stuff, even with other truck drivers. Another truck driver can't stop an 80,000 pound truck coming downhill when another truck pulls out in front of them. I like to call them an 80,000 pound torpedo. That's absolutely. Because that's what they are. Yeah. On 18 wheels, right? Yeah. So today we're here talking about uh, an issue that a lot of people may or may not be familiar with called tort reform. You hear a lot of elected officials saying, we need tort reform. It's a buzzword. It's a buzzword, but what are, they, what are they really saying behind those words? They're protecting their profits of yeah. those who make big money. Corporations. Corporations, primarily. In other words, limiting the ability to sue them. Correct. When they are at fault to pay big awards. They make it very difficult, not only to sue them and yeah. proceed against them, but if you get an award, then you have to deal with problems in the court system. What a lot of people don't realize with tort reform, like in your neighboring state of uh, Louisiana, there is a cap on medical malpractice cases. A person can get severely injured by the incompetence or negligence of a doctor, and the most that they can recover is $500,000, which is a combination of pain and suffering and economic loss. And if you're making $100,000 a year and you're 35 years old and you were gonna work another 20, 20, 25 years, 
you know, that would have been a substantial amount of money you're not going to get. If the medical cost are in the millions because there's a cap, someone else has to pay those medical costs, and that's generally the government, the government. Yeah. yeah, Medicare, Medicaid, government, yeah. taxpayer. Which a lot of people don't realize, and that's why we're having this uh, show today, because tort reform is kind of a buzzword, as you said, that people think they're going to reduce the amount of frivolous lawsuits that are filed against corporations. So let's talk about this myth. There is a myth that there is a surfeit, a surplus of lawsuits, frivolous lawsuits filed against companies to get jackpot justice. What's the fallacy there? Well, to begin with, in, in my field of practice, personal injury, trucking cases, car wreck cases, we file about 6% of the total amount of lawsuits total for personal injuries, wrongful death, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that would be a total fallacy. Mm -hmm. um, there is no jackpot justice. Right. I mean, first of all, if you get a verdict that's too large in Alabama, the Supreme Court's going to cut it. Yeah. There are methods by which the defense can have the verdicts cut yeah. by going through the system. Yeah, and, uh, and we were talking about this when we were driving here. A lot of times you could have a great trial lawyer like yourself get a huge verdict. That verdict is appealed. And it's appealed to appellate judges who are generally appointed in those positions by maybe a Republican, maybe a Democrat, right? But don't basically feel the same kind of compassion that you were able to generate with that jury about your client. And oftentimes they will reduce the award or overturn it for some maybe legal technicality, right? Absolutely. And unfortunately, your client ends up basically getting nothing. We did a story, a couple of stories with you. Brandy Staples was one. And if I remember the case, she was hit by a truck driver, a van driver, right. who was on his computer. Right. He wasn't paying attention to the road. Right. This was pre-texting, right? right? But the same kind of element. Um, in that case, how long did it take to... to you went to trial on it, if I remember right. No, we settled that case. You settled the case. But how long did it take? I would say it took about a year and a half. That was a quick one. Most of them take sometimes five, six, seven years. But in those kind of cases, the life care plan is huge, isn't it? Life care plan was up in the $20, $25 million. Yeah. And it was settled confidentially, right? Yes. Yeah. Now, in the train crash where the guy was operating the truck, the train hit him, you went to trial on that, didn't you? No, it settled. That settled too, huh? But I mean, these are long drawn out processes. Oh yeah, and, and you know, what? one thing people don't understand is the law firm itself has to finance the lawsuit. Yes. And you're talking 50 to 100, 150, 200,000 yeah. dollars. An airbag case will cost you 300, 400,000 dollars. And why does it cost so much money? Experts fighting the system, having to go up on appeal, everything's appeal. Yeah. So a lot of that's the lawyer's time. Lawyer's time, but it's also pain to people who help the lawyers with all the experts. Right. The, any products case is heavily laden with expert testimony, right. and they're not cheap. Right. So we recently had a products case where the guy was up in one of the northern states, and his billing practice was when he leaves the house, it's five hundred dollars an hour till he gets back to his house. So if he's down here a week with us, it's five hundred dollars an hour, twenty four hours a day. What if his plan was delayed? It's five hundred dollars an hour. <laughs> So th that runs up that runs up cost. Wow. That's why you got to be careful which ones you get involved in. Yeah. Now, what type of caps? Because tort reform, in essence, is almost a synonym for caps. Some way, somehow, a law has been passed which is limiting the amount of money you can recover in cases. How do you find that in the cases that you work on? Caps are more court driven. Yeah. We know if we go to trial and we get a death case uh, and the jury returns a verdict of $10 million, that the Supreme Court of Alabama is going to cut that considerably. Why? Just because that's what they're not going to let you live with that kind of money. Because they think it's too much money? It's too much money. And they'll look at the conduct yeah. to downgrade. You know, the jury might have got outraged that the person was drunk. Yeah. Well, the Supreme Court would say, well, he wasn't that drunk, but we're going to let you keep three and a half million. That's what that's what that case is worth. Right. Take it or leave it. Now, on the Alabama State Supreme Court, you have how many justices? 
I guess there's nine. How many have it been appointed by a Republican? They're they're elected. They're elected. They may be appointed if somebody drops out, but then they have to run for election. In our, Alabama, our what is a typical justice spend? I'm thinking they spend about five million dollars. And the term is for how long? Five years, six maybe years. maybe five or six years. So every six years. You have judge now. Where does a lot of that money come from? Oh, it's political. It's yeah, but where does the money come from to fund corporations? Trial lawyers. We all we all try to pick our candidate and help them get elected. Exactly. They have unlimited budgets. Okay. When someone gives one of these justices money, what do they expect in return? Well, I don't think they would expect favorable rulings. Favorable ruling, <laughs> like cutting the awards, right? Oh yeah. How would you see the system change? Being more fair. Just yeah. being just like a just like watching a ball game. Yeah. Good call. I asked a lawyer in Texas, you know, Texas is the, the Texas State Supreme Court is stacked with appointees from George Bush and Rick Perry, all Republicans, you know, all favorable to corporations. I said, how do you practice plaintiff's law in the state of Texas? And he says, Steve, I'll tell you this. They can't appeal all the cases. They don't have enough time. Yeah. You know, so the benefit that they settle cases like you do. What is a good settlement for someone? It depends on what kind of case it is. Yeah. If it's a, a brain injury case, um, you've got a good um, case, disability, eight, ten million dollars is good, yeah. four million maybe. It just depends on the, every case is so different. Yeah. It's like when somebody comes in, I'm representing somebody, and they say, well, my brother got so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. yeah. I said, well, let me, let me see all your brother's files. Let me see the case, and I'll tell you why he got that, right. and I'll tell you why you're only getting 30000 and he got three hundred. Yeah. There's a big difference in those kind of cases. Right. Right. Disability, injuries, extent of damage, and sometimes the conduct of the defendant. Mm -hmm. You know, if, you've got, a, if, you, if you've got an 18-wheeler driver smoking dope, doing yeah. drugs, you know, you're gonna get on up in the eight figures you've got some serious damage. Yeah. How do you see your law firm, you've been around, how many years you've been practicing? About 33. How do you see your law firm different from other law firms in the way they handle cases? We probably do more, um, I have it set up where certain people do certain things on a case, then it goes to the next station. Yeah. I've had a paralegal with me for 22 years. She does all the gathering. The clients have to call her after every appointment. It goes into the system. Yeah. The lawyer can look in the system at any time and see what the status of the client's treatment is. It makes a bond with the client and the staff. We try to be more family oriented. Uh, we're friendly with our clients. We treat them, we let them actually come in the door. They actually come in and sit down in our office. Many big plaintiff's firms and big TV firms, they send everything by mail order, send investigators to their houses. We actually do it the old fashioned way. And we actually file lawsuits. We've yeah. probably got 15 to 20 lawsuits filed in two or three states at any one time. Mm -hmm. What states do you practice in? Practice primarily in Georgia and Alabama, but we go other places if we need to. We've got one in Kentucky right now, which is a truck on truck case. Yeah. Um, but we've got them scattered around different places. And of course, we always associate, we just settled a death case over in Louisiana with a good firm over there. Uh, we usually associate law firms in that state and go with them. Mm -hmm. How do you see the justice system changing right now? I don't know that I see any changes right now. It's this it's constant battle. When I hear people talking about tort reform in these days, I say, what else can they do? Right. I mean, it was all done back in the 80s primarily. Well, you know, Congress right now had considered a national cap on non-economic damages, pain and suffering in medical malpractice cases because they're still pitching this idea that the reason that the doctor's medical insurance premiums are going up is because they have these outlandish awards. You know, nobody's ever, nobody's ever looked at the insurance company's profits right. to see right. why the things keep going up. Right. You know, in Alabama, doctors and nurses win 89 to 95% of all cases filed against them. Really? So why the insurance companies should, and, and there's only a handful of laws that law firms that'll take them. Right. I and mean, we wouldn't touch one. We yeah. wouldn't touch a med mal case. Yeah. A lot of times we don't even refer them out. We don't even want to be involved in them. We probably get calls 10 a month, yeah. every, every month. Every month you get a lot of calls from people you're well known who have, may have some cases. How do you end up selecting the cases that you finally choose to represent the people? Well, it starts off with my intake people. They do an intake interview over the phone. Then we do a call back and do a more thorough intake. Then we actually have them come into the office and we look for fault. 
Can we prove liability? Is it clear as a bell? If it is, we take it. Yeah. Then we look at damages. Yeah. Is it worth taking? If we're going to have to spend time and three, four, five, six thousand dollars on a small case, is it going to resolve for more than that to make it worth the time and the effort? Right. What about the character of the person, the client? That matters. Yeah. Uh, some of them will take, but we tell we will never file a lawsuit for you because of your background check and your record, your criminal cases, because all that gets to come in to trash your plaintiff. Right. Um, but just because somebody's been to the penitentiary or has, has had issues, if a truck runs over them and they're on a motorcycle, doesn't mean they're not entitled to their, you know, their, their medical care and their pain and suffering and all that stuff. So we will take them, but sometimes we'll just tell them, you know, yeah. we cannot file this in this particular county, depending on what county it is, too. Yeah. Because of the jury pool. Jury pool. Some counties are more liberal than others. Some counties wouldn't care. Some counties would. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you very much for being on our show. and and giving us some insight about this state and tort reform, et cetera. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at insiderexclusive.com.